Well, hello and welcome to another True Light Fellowship Wednesday night Bible study on behalf of our pastor and founder, uh, Dr. Wesley Pinnock. We want you to know that Jesus loves you and we love you too. Uh, so regardless of what you might be facing in life, regardless of the situations or circumstances of life, uh, help is here. Help is in the word of God. Uh, in the word of God, we have a hiding place at Psalm 119 and verse 114. Uh, but we have a wonderful Bible study for you tonight. But before we get into that study, we want to acknowledge the Lord. We want to commit our time uh, to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for uh, another day that you've allowed us to see. We don't take anything for granted. We thank you for the blessings uh, that you have given to us, the activity of our limbs, uh, clothing us in our right minds. We thank you for the honor and the privilege that we have uh, to be able to open up your word and to be able to study your word and to learn more about you. And so we pray that as we open up your word that you would send the power of your Holy Spirit, the uh, anointing of your Holy Spirit, uh, the presence of your Holy Spirit uh, to teach us uh, to allow us to be better in our tomorrows than we were in our yesterdays uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. We uh, have another opportunity to uh, study the Word of God, and uh, we'd like to study tonight uh, to the theme of the roadmap to recovery, the roadmap uh, to recovery. When we say uh, roadmap, uh, it refers to a process, a process, uh, not an overnight uh, process, uh, but a process nevertheless. Uh, it implies um, getting again, getting again something uh, that was lost. Uh, but let's uh, read uh, for our uh, text, for our basic text, our main text, uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 30. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30, and we're going to be reading uh, verses 1 through 19. Again, that's 1 Samuel chapter 30, and we're going to uh, read from verses 1 uh, through verse uh, 19. Uh, so if you found it, uh, let's read. Uh, now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag uh, on the third day uh, that the Amalekites uh, had invaded the south and Ziklag attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken captive the woman and those uh, who were there from small to great. Uh, they did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city and there it was burned with fire uh, and their wives, their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Uh, and David's two wives, uh, Ahinoam, uh, the Jezreelitess, uh, and Abigail, uh, the widow of Nabal, uh, the Carmelite, uh, had been taken captive. Uh, now David was greatly distressed, uh, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people uh, was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abiathar, uh, the priest, uh, Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar uh, brought the ephod to David. Uh, so David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. So David went, he and the 600 men uh, who were with him, and came to the brook Besor, uh, where those stayed uh, who were left behind. But David pursued, he and 400 men, uh, for 200 stayed behind, who were so weary that they could not cross the brook Besor. Uh, then they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David, and they gave him bread, and he ate, and they let him drink water. Uh, and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs uh, and two clusters of raisins. Uh, so when he had eaten, his strength came back to him, uh, for he had eaten no bread uh, nor drunk water for three days and three nights. Then David said to him, To whom do you belong, and where are you from? And he said, I am a young man from Egypt, servant of an Amalekite, uh, and my master left me behind, because three days ago I fell sick. 
uh, we made an invasion of the southern area of the Cherethites uh, in the territory which belongs to Judah uh, and of the southern area of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Can you take me down to this troop? So he said, Swear to me by God that you will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this troop. And when he had brought him down, uh, there they were spread out over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines uh, and from the land of Judah. Then David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives, uh, and nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything which they had taken from them. David recovered all. So we see a lot happening here, uh, but we have to realize uh, as we look at the application now to our lives that sometimes uh, the Christian believer... Uh, whether it's uh, through their own fault uh, or the fault of uh, attacking forces, uh, may find themselves in difficulty, uh, in uh, affliction, uh, sometimes in prison-like circumstances, sometimes even in oppressive uh, circumstances, uh, and may need to be free, uh, may need to find uh, the road that leads to freedom. Uh, sometimes the Christian believer uh, may even know someone, it may not be you, but you may know someone, family or friends, a loved one that needs to be rescued. Uh, but whatever the case, uh, there are lessons from this passage now uh, that we're going to look at. Uh, there are lessons uh, which show us the road to recovery, the road to recovery, the road map to recovery. Uh, so let's look uh, at a little background uh, of the text, the book of 1 Samuel, authored by uh, Samuel and by others, um, all writing under the inspiration, of course, of the Holy Spirit, uh, dated around 930 BC, uh, perhaps a little later. Um, it covers the period now uh, from the childhood of Samuel uh, to a part of, a portion of the reign of David. It focuses on three characters, uh, Samuel, uh, Saul, and David. Uh, and it also focuses now on the effect of, um, and this is a theme, a type of theme, the effect of disobedience or obedience upon uh, leadership and upon the people as well. So when do the events uh, in the text happen uh, in the span of David's life? Well, as you look at this book, you see uh, the anointing of Saul as king. Uh, you see the disobedience of Saul. Uh, you see uh, the rejection of Saul. Samuel came and told him that he was rejected. You see now the anointing of David. Uh, we see in this book uh, David's fight with uh, Goliath around the 17th chapter. You see Saul's persecution of David, uh, you see Samuel's death, uh, and then you see uh, David seeking to align himself uh, with the Philistines uh, and is allowed uh, for a time to stay at a place called Ziklag, uh, used it as perhaps a base uh, and travel to fight in various places. Uh, Saul in desperation now, uh, we see uh, in this book, not being able to hear from God, uh, Saul consults uh, a witch, or as many translations call a medium. Uh, and just before now, the death of Saul and Jonathan in battle, uh, the Philistines, they reject David. Uh, and they tell him to get his things out of uh, Ziklag, to go to Ziklag and get his things out and pack up and leave. So David now arrives uh, at Ziklag and what does he find? He finds that a group of people called the Amalekites, that they have invaded Ziklag uh, and that they have burned it and that they have taken captives, uh, including uh, his family and the soldiers' families as well. Uh, now, the Amalekites, who were they? We can't spend too much time talking about who they were, but uh, they were always uh, bitter foes of Israel. Uh, we see them warring against Israel uh, in the time of Saul and in the time of David, uh, and even moving forward, uh, forward to the days of Hezekiah. Uh, you can see a reference for that in 1 Chronicles chapter 4 and verse 43. 
Uh, so then the question is, as we look at our text now, um, what do you do uh, when what you have, uh, what you treasure, what you value, what is precious to you is taken away uh, by an enemy uh, and it takes you by surprise. You weren't suspecting it. Uh, you weren't prepared for it. Sometimes the precious thing uh, that needs to be recovered uh, is not necessarily external or from without, but sometimes even from within where one's own heart uh, can be led astray and needs uh, to be recovered, can be led astray by the things of the world. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 says, all that is in the world is a lust in the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And sometimes these things can lead our hearts astray where we actually need to be uh, recovered. So what then now is the road to recovery? Uh, the text says that the woman and children uh, were carried away. Uh, and sometimes, again, the enemy can come in if we're not careful and carry precious things away. Uh, will burn things down. The Bible says that the thief comes only to steal, to kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly or that you might have it uh, to the full. That's John chapter 10, uh, verse 10. But listen, captivity is painful. Captivity is painful, painful on several uh, levels, uh, painful uh, to more than one person, uh, painful to the captive, but also uh, painful to the family of the captive. Uh, we see uh, the pain in the text. We see pain. Uh, David and the people, uh, the soldiers, uh, these were not weak individuals. They're strong men of war. Uh, but what did they do? They lifted up their voices and they wept. Uh, they bewailed. They lamented. They mourned. Uh, they had tears. They had a strong, this is, look, this is a strong uh, emotional response to serious distress that they were going through. Uh, the, the, the text says that until they had no more power to weep. Wow. Uh, that's a serious level of weeping. So the question is, have you ever been uh, so distressed in life uh, that you cried until you had no more power uh, left to cry? Uh, well, let me tell you, let me tell you, God understands those tears. God understands those tears. Uh, the Bible says that we do not have a high priest that cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Uh, and our high priest now, uh, he knows what it is to be distressed. He knows what it is to be distressed. He was distressed uh, so intensely uh, that his sweat, the Bible says, became as it were uh, great drops of blood. That's Luke chapter 22 and verse 44. So listen, Jesus understands. Jesus understands. Whatever you're going through, Jesus understands. Uh, but as we look at the text now, we see that David was affected in a very unique way. The Bible says that David was greatly distressed, greatly distressed. He was uh, pressed. Uh, it's a strange word uh, because it also means um, fashioned. It also means that he was formed or he was uh, framed uh, like a potter uh, fashioning uh, a vessel. Uh, listen, in the midst of your difficulty, in the midst of your distress, in the midst of your being pressed, uh, there is something that is being formed in you. There is something that is being fashioned in you. There's something that is being framed by the master potter. Uh, you see tears, you see tears, but God sees uh, the ground uh, that it is watering for growth. You might see uh, the fire, uh, but God sees the purifying work that it's accomplishing. But as we look now again at the text, uh, the question is, why was David greatly distressed? And a lot of it had to do with the people. A lot of it had to do with the people. Uh, leaders have to understand, uh, leaders of any type, um, that people can cause you distress. People can cause you distress. They can cause you to behave out of character, uh, can cause you to miss uh, your quote unquote promised land, uh, Numbers chapter 20, verse 12. 
Uh, so uh, we have to be careful how uh, we respond uh, to people. And it doesn't matter what leadership uh, position you're in. It could be at work. It could be in your community. But you have to be careful how you respond to the people. But what was it about the people? Uh, they were about to stone him. They're about to stone him uh, because their family was taken captive. Uh, so we see then that David had what we might call um, a multi-front warfare, uh, war raging on all sides, um, at war against the Amalekites who took the fa their families, uh, at war against his own men that wanted to stone him, uh, war against uh, Saul who still wanted to kill him, uh, at war against the Philistines who no longer trusted him. Uh, and don't forget now, uh, his own internal warfare from within, uh, warfare against uh, sin, temptation, uh, the flesh and the devil. Uh, listen, it's hard to fight a multi-front warfare, a war on many sides. And you might even feel that right now in life. You might be going through that right now. Uh, there might be trouble on every side right now uh, at work, uh, at home, uh, in the community. And listen, sometimes even in ministry as well. So the question is, how do you handle it? How do you handle it? What do you do? Um, what do you say uh, when you have lost all that is precious to you? Uh, and sometimes all uh, those that are supposed to support you, uh, they are not around or they might even be turning against you. Uh, what do you do? What do you say? How do you handle a situation like that? Well, the answer is by realizing that there is one that will not turn against you. Uh, there is one that is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. That's Proverbs chapter 18, 24. And listen, uh, that friend is God. That friend uh, is Christ Jesus. Uh, John chapter 15, verse 15. You can see a reference for that. And so listen, the first step, we're talking about the roadmap uh, to recovery. Uh, the first step on the roadmap to recovery is to strengthen yourself in the Lord your God. Strengthen yourself in the Lord your God. To strengthen oneself means uh, to find strength in, to find strength in. It implies that the strength uh, is not in our own self, is not in our own self, but we know how to access it. We know where to find it. My friend, whatever you are going through today, uh, you can find strength in the Lord. You can find strength in the Lord in Yahweh, the one that is in covenant relationship with you, the one that has made promises to you, the one that has obligated himself uh, to you. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, it says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will what? strengthen you. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 30 and 31. Many of you know it already. It says, even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, it says, uh, For in that he himself, talking about Jesus, has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid, to aid those who are tempted. Uh, so as we look now back on our text, so we see that David was strengthened by the Lord. Uh, but David took another step on this roadmap to recovery. Uh, he inquired of the Lord. He inquired of the Lord. Uh, he brought his case to the Lord. Uh, he made a petition, uh, in other words, a petition to the Lord before the Lord. He made a request before uh, the Lord. Uh, shall I pursue is the question. Uh, listen, this shows his humility. It shows uh, his dependency on the Lord. Now listen, David was an anointed musician. Uh, David was uh, an anointed 
songwriter. David was a victorious, uh, mighty warrior. Uh, David was anointed uh, to be king. And yet in all of those things, in all of those things, he's still not presumptuous. He's not assuming anything. He's not assuming that he can do it all by himself, uh, but he continuously sees himself in need of help from the Lord, in need of guidance from the Lord, in need of following what God says. That's a wonderful place to be. Sometimes there are those that have an anointing in their lives uh, and they feel as though just because they have an anointing, just because they have a gift, that they have it all figured out, that they know it all. Uh, they show their strength by being uh, decisive about everything, that they can, they know everything, every issue, every problem, they have the answer to. Well, listen, nobody knows everything. Nobody knows everything about, listen, there's one that does know everything and his name is God Almighty. His name is Jesus. Uh, but here uh, we see again uh, the anointed king of Israel, the sweet psalmist of Israel, as he's uh, referred to, uh, he asked the Lord, he submits himself to the counsel of God Almighty, and he says, should we pursue? Uh, this was not now uh, an isolated act of David. It seems that it was David's habit uh, to inquire of the Lord, especially in an intense battle, an intense situation. Listen, many of us are in intense situations in life and what we need to do, uh, we need to inquire of the Lord like David did. David did that many times. You can see references of 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse one through three, uh, the same chapter 23, verses four through five, the same chapter 23, verses 10 through 11, and again in that same chapter, verses 12 through 14. Uh, Moses was another one uh, who, uh, when faced with great crisis, he seemed to fall on his face before the Lord. He seemed to call on the Lord. Uh, we see that in Numbers chapter 16, verses one through four. Uh, you can check out Numbers chapter nine, verse eight. You can check out Exodus chapter 14, verse 15. And you can also check out Exodus chapter 32 and verse 11. So it seems that it is a mark of a great leader of a great leader to do this. It's a lesson of leadership for us all today, uh, that when faced with crisis, with trouble, with distress, with difficulty, uh, whether it's at work, whether it's at uh, or in the community, or whether it's at home, or even if it's in the church, before you talk with men, before you argue with people, fall down on your face before the Lord, I guarantee you, it will change the way that you deal with the circumstance. So as we go back to our text in 1 Samuel 30, I notice now the nature of David's question. Uh, he's not passively asking the Lord just to uh, hide him, but it's, it's a, in one sense, it's an offensive type of movement forward uh, that we see. Uh, that uh, David is not saying, Lord, I don't want to do anything. Lord, I'm fearful. Lord, just hide me somewhere. Uh, but it's offensive in the sense of moving forward. Shall I pursue? That's what he's talking about. In other words, shall I attack? Uh, it's a word that implies hostile intent. And I was just thinking, oh, how we need believers today to have hostility toward uh, the enemy. Uh, so many times the hostility is towards each other uh, and submissive behavior towards the enemy, uh, but it has to be the other way around. Uh, so it implies now, as we look at this, uh, shall I pursue or shall I attack? It implies to pursue, it implies a military engagement, uh, a violent effort. Uh, so David is, is discussing detailed battle plans with the Lord. Uh, he's saying, shall I overtake them? Shall I overtake them? Uh, he's discussing strategy now. So we see now that David's secret weapon in battle uh, was his consultation with the Lord uh, who uh, would set his battle plans, tell him whether or not he should go forward in that situation or at that time. Uh, this is the offensive attack that we too 
are called to make. Uh, but listen, our weapons are not uh, physical, but they are spiritual, uh, but they are still offensive. They're still offensive. Second Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verse four, you can check out. Uh, listen, we are called to go on the offense. We are called to go on the offense. Listen, a team that plays only defense uh, will not win the game, will not win the game. Uh, but the great commission that Matthew 28 verses 19 through 20, that go command is talking about offense. It's a moving forward. It's an offensive type of movement uh, battle plan. Uh, so now we come to the next step on the roadmap to recovery. Uh, what's that next step? It's getting an answer from the Lord, getting an answer from the Lord. Listen, the essence of success in battle, a success in recovery is being able to hear from the Lord. Uh, the Lord said, pursue for you shall surely overtake them and what? Without fail, recover all. Wow. Uh, listen, having received that, the battle is as good as over. It's as good as over. Yes, David would have to walk through the steps, but it was as good as done because he who fills all time and space said, you will overtake them and you will recover everything. Listen, when God speaks, when God makes promises, uh, it is a done deal. God is not a man that he should lie, uh, nor the son of man that he should repent. Uh, has he said uh, and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? That's Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19. So listen, all of the promises of God in him uh, are yes and in him, amen. In other words, so be it to the glory of God uh, through us at 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. But we also see that although the battle uh, is as good as won, uh, that we also have to walk through it, that David still had to walk through that battle. Uh, so there may be aspects uh, that we have to walk through uh, based upon uh, the promises of God, based upon uh, the word of God. And so we know that Christ uh, was manifested on earth uh, to destroy the works of the devil. That's 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Uh, but we still have to walk through uh, the path of this victory won. And that's why we, of course, fight uh, the good fight of faith. That's 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Uh, in a war that's already won, in a war that's already won. Uh, this shows us what some scholars refer to as the already uh, not yet uh, kingdom of God. Uh, and so we see the next step now on the roadmap to recovery is to take a step forward based upon the promises of God, to take a step forward based upon the promises of God. The text said that David went. Uh, listen, there comes a point in time where we have to simply move forward. Yes, there is a time to wait. Uh, yes, there is a time to train. Yes, there is a time to study. Yes, there is a time to plan. But there comes a time where you have to take a step forward, where you have to engage, where you have to get it done. You have to get the job done. We noticed that warfare was not easy. Uh, that it was a tiring uh, effort. Uh, we see in the text uh, that not all of the soldiers crossed over the brook be sore. Uh, some, listen, some in life, uh, as we engage in warfare uh, in our lives, uh, there are some that will start out with us, uh, but some may not remain. Some friends uh, may not remain. Some may not want to fight uh, the good fight of faith. Uh, so we see that David crossed over and, and received assistance. That's what we see. Uh, listen, on the road map to recovery, God will send help. God will send help to minister to you. God knows how to take care of his own. He knows our journey and he knows how to take care of us. Uh, sometimes it might be a word from a preacher. Uh, it might be a godly friend uh, sitting down with you uh, over a cup of coffee uh, with the Bible open. Uh, it might be a book uh, that's written by a Christian author uh, that speaks 
to what you are going through speaks to exactly what you're going through and minister to you, ministers to you. But whatever it is, God knows how to send the help that's needed on the road to recovery. So we see then that the next step on the roadmap to recovery is the ruthless attack against the enemy, uh, really showing no mercy. Uh, Notice the unrelenting, the unceasing, uh, shock and awe nature of the attack. Notice the attack upon uh, the unsuspecting, vulnerable uh, enemy uh, eating uh, and drinking. Uh, And the Bible says that David recovered all. Listen, God is calling us to be ruthless against whatever we are facing, whatever difficulty we are facing. The real war is against spiritual wickedness in high places, the rulers of the darkness of this world, principalities and powers that do not want to see us succeed. As Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Uh, we don't play games with them. Uh, we don't show mercy upon them. We don't feel sorry for them. We don't let up in the intensity of our effort. Uh, listen, if you are praying, you may not even see the answer right away, but if you are praying and you are pursuing your recovery and you're down on your knees, listen, do not give up. Do not let up for one moment. If you're interceding for someone, a wayward son or daughter, uh, and you're interceding for them, you're calling out their name every single day, every single night on your knees, listen, don't give up. It's not the time to let up or to give up. So this is a wonderful text uh, about the roadmap to recovery, uh, but we see another example in the Bible of recovery and it's found in Genesis chapter 14, verses eight through 16. Genesis chapter 14, uh, verses eight through 16, uh, and it reads, and the king of Sodom, uh, the king of uh, Gomorrah, uh, the king of uh, Adma, the king of uh, Zeboam, uh, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and joined together in battle uh, in the valley of Sidim against Shador Lamor, king of Elam, Tidal, king of nations, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elasar. Uh, four kings against five. Uh, now the valley of Sidim was full of asphalt pits, uh, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Then they took all uh, the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods and departed. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by uh, the terebinth trees of Mamre uh, and Amrite, uh, brother of Eskol, the brother of Aner. And they were allies with Abram. Uh, Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, uh, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the woman and the people. So we see here now intentional activity in order to recover. Uh, We see the arming of individuals. We see the equipping of individuals. We see the mentioning of training. Uh, We see the movement forward in battle. Uh, We see strategy. Uh, We don't see confusion. We don't see disorder, Uh, but we see ultimately the recovery. Listen, the roadmap to recovery of what uh, is lost uh, in one's life it includes intentional behavior, intentionality, uh, something that is done on purpose. Uh, We have to be intentional uh, about recovering whatever needs to be recovered. Uh, It doesn't happen by chance. It doesn't happen by ignoring the issue or by being passive about the issue, Uh, but it happens by arming oneself. Uh, We arm ourselves, we equip ourselves, Uh, by reading 
the word of God, uh, the sword of the spirit. That's Ephesians chapter six, verse 17. Uh, we arm ourselves by praying. And as we pray, uh, we're pulling down the strongholds of the enemy. Uh, so we see now uh, that uh, the roadmap to recovery, it involves training. It involves discipline. Sometimes we don't like discipline. It involves correction. Sometimes we don't like correction. It involves rebounding. Listen, rebounding from mistakes, not giving up, but getting back on the saddle. Uh, it involves uh, gradual strengthening. Sometimes it's not an overnight process. Uh, it involves movement forward. It involves progress. It involves strategy. Dealing with issues in our lives involves strategy. If I'm dealing with doubt, if I'm being oppressed by doubt all the time, uh, well, maybe what I need to do strategically is to find scriptures that deal with doubt, uh, to pray about getting rid of doubt, uh, to take uh, the church uh, Bible classes uh, that strengthens uh, the heart that strengthens the mind, uh, to talk with a strong believer. We're talking about strategy now. Talk with a strong believer uh, about what we're going through, uh, to seek Christian counseling about it, uh, to read Bible-based books that have to do uh, with getting delivered from doubt, uh, perhaps even turning one's plate down, um, saying, I'm not going to eat dinner today, I'm gonna to skip, or I'm gonna skip lunch today, and instead, I am going to seek God about this battle that I'm having uh, with doubt, or, or with whatever the situation is. Uh, so, it's important that we develop strategies uh, as we're dealing with the roadmap to recovery. Sometimes a strategy can, can also be uh, tracking uh, the patterns of the enemy's activity, uh, tracking and noticing how the enemy might attack you with doubt or when the enemy might attack you with doubt or whatever the situation is. Another important thing to do on the roadmap to recovery is to rejoice over victories, is to memorialize victories and rejoice over them. Uh, another thing is to never let one's guard down in battle uh, any successful soldier knows that you never let your guard down. But let's now look at another example of recovery. Uh, indeed, the greatest example of recovery, uh, the greatest recovery is found in no other than Christ Jesus. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21, and it reads, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself uh, through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Uh, so we see now um, that man, and of course, uh, man is born in sin. Uh, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Uh, and of course, the wages of sin is death. That's Romans 6, 23. Uh, but we see that man uh, is in need of recovery, that man is in need of recovery. Uh, like what David and his men lost, man has lost uh, what is dear to him, what is dear to him, his soul his soul. Man is distressed uh, because of what uh, he has lost, just like David was greatly distressed. And as men began to turn on David to stone him, we as a society, we see evidence uh, because of our sin and our fallenness. We see evidence of people turning on each other, violence in the street, road rage leading to murder, uh, politicians uh, stooping to new lows and degradation. So man is in need of recovery. Man is in need of recovery. But now 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says that something happens 
when we come to Christ. Something happens when we come to Christ. We are a new creature. The old is passed away. And as David and his men were reconnected with their family, we are reconciled uh, with God. We are called now the righteousness of God. We are made every day more and more uh, to live out this calling. We're not sinless, but every day we sin less until the day that we will be delivered, uh, rescued from uh, the operation or the power of sin, and one day, of course, delivered from the very presence of sin. But the question is, how do we successfully walk down the road to recovery? My friend, the roadmap is in abiding in Christ. It's in abiding in Christ. Uh, John chapter 15, verse 1 through 8, it says, I am the true vine and my father uh, is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Uh, you are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Uh, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Uh, by this, my father is glorified uh, that you bear much fruit. So uh, you will be my disciples. So to abide, it means uh, to remain. It means to stay. Listen, People are coming up with all sorts of gimmicks, uh, tricks, uh, methods, formulas uh, to experience victory, uh, to experience recovery. Uh, some people are even charging a whole lot of money uh, to give answers uh, where only the rich can get it and the poor is not able to get it. But listen, uh, the Bible, God's eternal truth makes it very plain. So what is the Bible's roadmap? It's abiding in Christ, remaining in Christ, being under the direction of God through Christ Jesus, hearing from God, obeying God. It's all found in God. It's all found in Christ. Listen, when you see David moving through his steps to recover all, when you see him strengthening himself in the Lord, we do that. We do that by abiding in Christ. When you see David inquiring of the Lord, we do that by abiding in Christ in prayer, for it's through uh, our high priest, Christ Jesus, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. That's Hebrews chapter four, verses 15 through 16. When you see David hearing from the Lord, for us, we hear from the Lord by abiding in Christ and reading the word of God. Uh, when you see David taking a step forward uh, on the promises of God, for us, all of this is found in abiding in Christ. For when we are in Christ, we are under his direction. And all of the promises of God, uh, all of the promises of God in Christ are yes uh, and in him, amen. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Listen, everything we need for recovery is found in in Christ Jesus. For this purpose, he was manifest uh, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. And it doesn't matter what the works of the devil are. Christ manifested in your life will destroy it. It doesn't matter what the sin is. It doesn't matter what the habit is. It doesn't matter what the stronghold is. It doesn't matter how long the struggle has been. It doesn't even matter if there has been a relapse into sin. Christ is able to break the power of the enemy. The Bible says very clearly in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. Listen, this is not the word of man. It's not my word but it's the word of God, it's eternal truth. And it says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Uh, this is what God, the creator of the universe says to those that are in Christ. So listen, whatever the struggle is, 
uh, put it against the word of God. Every single day, confess the word of God and watch the word of God destroy the power of sin every time. Uh, it'll expose it and it will destroy it. Uh, a great army general described his military strategy uh, called by some shock and awe, uh, but he told of the strategy in a certain war. And he said, listen, this is what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to cut it off and then we're going to kill it. Uh, wow. That is very ruthless. And that's just man. Listen, the word of God is even more ruthless against the power of sin, for it is alive and it is sharper than any two-edged sword. That's Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verse 12. So listen, we've been talking about the roadmap to recovery. Uh, I don't know what might be lost in your life. Uh, I don't know um, what might be lost in the life of a friend that you know that you may need to minister to. Could be lost purpose could be lost self-esteem, uh, could be lost peace, it could be lost faith in what God uh, can do, it could be lost finances, it could be lost uh, marriage, uh, it could be lost ministry, it could be even lost health, uh, it could be lost integrity, uh, lost uh, integrity, in other words, dishonesty, uh, it could be lost uh, convictions, moral con convictions, moral compass, it could be lost purity uh, that is commanded in scripture uh, could be addictions it could be strongholds but whatever it is whatever has been lost whatever the battle is listen there is a road map to recovery there is a road map to recovery there is a way out there is a way out you're not in an impossible situation for with god all things are possible uh the only listen the only road is not down the only road is not down. God is able to put you on the road map to recovery and give you a testimony uh, to help someone in need. Well, I pray that this Bible study has been a blessing to you. If it has, please share it with someone else uh, so that they uh, will be able to learn and grow. We'd like to pause at this time uh, to give you the opportunity to worship the Lord uh, in the giving of your tithes and your offerings. The information is on the screen. Online giving can be made at truelightfellowship.org slash giving. Uh, if you're sending a gift, uh, it can be mailed to 6400 Ardley Street, Philadelphia, PA 19119. And checks, of course, can be made payable to True Light Fellowship Church. We also don't want to end without remembering to pray for those that are in need. Certainly want to pray for those that are bereaved, those uh, that are sick and shut in. Uh, we want to remember to always pray for our church leaders. We want to pray uh, also for our civic leaders as well. We want to pray for those that are in authority um, in our city streets, uh, that they would um, act uh, in a godly manner, that they would have wisdom, and that they would be protected as well. We want to remember to pray uh, for our youth and young adult. Uh, we want to pray for our various ministries in our church. Uh, we want to pray, uh, of course, uh, for, again, for our government leaders and our cities all around uh, the world, that the Lord uh, would uh, keep them safe. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this wonderful word that you've given us. We just thank you that your word is life. We thank you that your word provides guidance. We thank you that you have made a way uh, for us uh, to recover from whatever situation we might find ourselves in, Lord. We thank you that you are a God of mercy and that you are a God of grace and you are a God of love. Uh, and so we just thank you uh, for the power of your word to transform our lives. And we pray that even as we've heard your word, uh, that we would be able to apply it in our lives. We pray that if we know someone uh, that might be going through a difficult situation, that might be stuck in life, uh, we pray that you would give us the courage uh, to be able to reach out to them uh, with this word, uh, that their lives might be changed uh, for your glory. We pray that you would touch um, our, our church uh, members. We pray that you would touch uh, those that are going through difficult situations, those that might be bereaved at this time. We pray that you would comfort their heart right now, that you would strengthen them in the name of Jesus. During times of sadness, we pray that you would uphold them in the name of Jesus, we pray. We pray that you would touch uh, even uh, those that are sick and shut in, that you would uh, reach out and heal them, Lord, right where they are, wherever they are, Lord, in the bedroom, in the hospital room. Uh, we pray that you would 
uh, send your healing virtue uh, in the name of Jesus and uh, bring healing and recovery to them in Jesus name. We remember Pastor Mark that you would just continue to touch him, uh, continue to allow him to experience your healing virtue and bring healing and recovery 100% uh, in the name of Jesus we pray. We pray that you would touch our youth and young adult, that you would uphold them, that you would continue to work uh, through them in the name of Jesus we pray. We pray Lord God that you would touch uh, even uh, our church leaders, that you would touch our senior pastor and his wife, uh, continue to anoint them afresh, that you would touch all of the leaders of our church in the name of Jesus, we pray. We pray that you would touch uh, the civic leaders. We pray that you would touch our, govern, our government leaders, uh, that you would allow them uh, to act with wisdom, allow them to act in a godly manner for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.